In this video, I'm going to show you how to combine satellite data with Blender to create 3D models that are accurate in both uh, geology and in color. So for example, this is a 3D render of the San Francisco Bay Area that I created using satellite data, uh, running it through software called QGIS or QGIS, and then using that software to generate texture maps and bump maps and displacement maps that were then imported into Blender to create this final scene. So in order to do this project, you're going to need both QGIS, QGIS, which is a graphical information system software. It's free. Uh, you need to go to QGIS.org to download the software. Um, so just go here, download it, and install it if you don't have it. And the other software you will need is Blender, uh, which you can get at Blender.org. It is also free. So go to their website, download, and install it. And once you're done that, we can talk about uh, getting the satellite data, which is also free. Now, there are lots of places to get satellite data, and I have links in the description as to where you can get other satellite data, but I'm going to use the USGS Earth Explorer uh, website. Uh, and this is what it looks like. It's here at earthexplorerusgs.gov. And you can see it gives us a map of the world. Um, you can scroll in and out using the scroll wheel. You can pan by using the middle mouse button, and that'll move you around. Um, and for this project, I'm just going to look at the San Francisco area because right, it's got some interesting water and mountain features. Um, the first thing you need to do is you need to choose your area of interest, because right now the software doesn't know uh, what part of planet Earth you're looking at, and you need to tell it. There are two ways to do this. You can just click on the map, and that'll give you pins, and that'll define a very area of interest, and then the software knows that you're looking inside this area. Another way to do that is to kind of focus on the area you're looking at, just kind of get it in your screen here, and then go down here to this button that says Use Map, and that will define the area inside of your current screen as the area of interest. And you can use this plus and minus if you want to scroll in a little bit differently. So Use Map, and you can see that it created a little pin here in the corner, a little pin there in the corner. And if I scroll out, you can see that it created pins that, fall, that fell right within our, my window originally. Right, the next thing we need to do is choose the, the data sets we're going to use. And we're going to use data from two different satellites. So going over here on the left, data sets. And then we want to look at the digital elevation maps. No, we want to look at the, sorry, we want to look at the digital elevation SRTM. SRTM stands for Shuttle Radar Topology Mission and we want to use the SRTM one arc second global. This is going to generate, or it's going to give us the height information that we use for the, the displacement map. It's going to be a grayscale map that shows us the topology of the area. The other map that we want to get, or the other data we want to get, comes from Landsat. And there are lots of different Landsat missions. We want to look at Landsat 9, and we want to look at the Collection 2 Level 1 because um, this is going to be the better data. So we just want to check this Landsat 8, 9 box. This is going to give us access to both Landsat 8 and 9, uh, but we can further filter what we see here uh, with some additional criteria. So click on additional criteria, and you can see we're looking at Landsat 9 now. If I drop down, I want to look at satellite. I click the plus, and I want to just choose 9. So 9 is the more recent satellite. It's going to have the better data. So we want to do that. And when you go back to our data sets, um, and we want to look at search criteria, we want to look at, we don't care about date range really for this, we're just looking for the data. Cloud cover is useful. If you're doing some place that is arid, um, so like maybe Spain or North Africa, you can get away with not adjusting this because there's rarely clouds in those areas. If you're doing some place um, like the Pacific Northwest, the United States or Scotland, where it's always cloudy, you might want to push this down um, to try to get clearer skies. If you push it too far down in those areas, you know places that are tenderly overcast, you may get zero results. So if I set this way down here and try to do um, topology for like Seattle, I might get very very few results because I get they have few so few days and have no clouds. So just to be on the safe side, maybe leave it 10, 15 percent, and then you can always manually exclude any images that have clouds that you don't want. You might want to click on this results option. Um, the big thing here is that you can change the number of items that show up in one page of the results. So I'm just going to set that to 50, and I think that is it for this. So now I can just go to results, 
You see it was searching for it, and it's going to bring up our results over here. And these are all going to be specific to our area of interest, and the results are actually separated within this drop-down box. So let me look at the uh, digital elevation map first. I'm going to select that one. You can see these are all grayscales. And you have some options here with these icons. So this footprint is going to show you where on the map this particular swatch of radar information came from, uh, or topology information came from. This next icon is actually going to show you what it looks like. So you can see that's a grayscale with the, the rivers and everything. So that's kind of outside of our area, so I'm not interested in that one. That one looks a little bit better, right? That one's kind of within the San Francisco area. And then you can see that they often are adjacent to each other. That one's too far out to sea. That one's a little too far northeast. There, that one's good. And then this one's probably good. So you can see these four fields cover the area of interest that we're looking at. So the next thing to do would be to download the data. So just looking at the ones where I've got the icons that I like, there is this download options button. So click on that. You're going to do this for each map you want. And you want to take the GeoTIFF one arc second download. You just click on that. It's going to download that. And you want to do that for each of the maps you're interested in downloading. Now I've already downloaded these, so I'm not going to do it again. By default, they're going to go into your uh, downloads folder. And then when we're done this, we're going to move those into some other folder so we can organize them. All right, so Matt, so assuming you've downloaded then all of your DEMs just by clicking on that download button, you then want to go to the Landsat option, choose that. And we're going to do the same thing, but this time we definitely want to look at the um, the thumbnail of the image because this is going to tell us where there are clouds. So this looks like a pretty good image. It's right in the middle of our area of interest, and I don't see any clouds on it. So that's a good one. These black ones, it means there's no data in them. We're not going to be able to use them. All right? That one's another good one. We've got a couple clouds up here, but they're pretty far north, so I can ignore those. And there's another good one. You know, the clouds are way off here on the mountains. I'm not worried about them. Um, and I think, you know, if we keep our area of interest pretty much on the San Francisco Bay area, these three maps will be good enough for us. Similarly, you want to use the download button for each of these. Now, this time, you have a couple of options. You really don't want any of these, at least I haven't found a use for them. But if you click on the product options, you have some choices. You can either download the entire set of data. Now Landsat transmits data um, in many, many bands. Uh, so you got 11 bands plus some other information in here. So I got band one, band two, band three, all the way up to band 11. If you want, you can download the entire set, um, but just be aware it's gonna be a gig. Or you can download the individual um, bands that we're interested in. So if you're tight on disk space, um, maybe not do that, but we will need bands two, three, four, and eight, right? So you could download the whole thing, or you can individually just download band four, band three, band two, and band eight. And then those files will also end up in your downloads folder. So I'm not gonna, again, I'm not gonna do it for all of them because I've already done it uh, just to save some time, but you can see that you get a new tab up here. It takes a second for it to load and then your download will start. And that's it for downloading the data. We can close these windows. Um, and the next thing I would do is I would move all of your data into some, I uh, move all your files from your download folder into a uh, common folder that you're gonna use for your project. Yeah, I chose just to move all my folders into a file called USGS files. And I chose to download the full data sets as opposed to the individual bands. I know these are big, but they're, they're temporary. Once the project is done, you can delete them. And then these are the individual uh, elevation map files. So you can see that they're just black and white images. These are actually zipped files that can be read within the program QGIS. So the next part is to go over to QGIS. All right, this is the QGIS interface. And we're just gonna click on, double click on new empty project. And hopefully your interface looks kind of like what mine does. We got a browser panel, layers, and over here I have two tabs, one for layer style and one for processing box. If your desktop looks different than mine, uh, go to view, panels, and make sure that you have the checks that I have here so you have the same panels that I do. And then go to toolbars and make sure that you've checked the same ones that I've checked because you're gonna be using some of these tools and panels. Um, and if you don't see them, then this is how you put them up. 
Another thing we want to do is we want to make sure that your raster folder looks like mine. So under this raster tab, there's a miscellaneous option. I don't think this is always turned on by default. So if you go to plugins and then go to installed and just make sure that this processing is checked. All right, because if it's not checked, then that raster miscellaneous menu item, I don't think it shows up on your screen. Uh, so it might be confusing if you don't actually see that there. Another thing we want to do is we want to make sure that you've installed uh, some software that'll help you fill some holes in the data. data. So if you go and you type in GDAL and you want to look for the virtual raster builder, which is this last one here, it's also called GDAL. Uh, this is going to let us fill in holes in the data and I'll show you how to how to do that later, but just make sure that this is installed. So I've already installed it, but uh, you would just you know search here for that, find this one, and then you know install the plugin, and you should be good to go for that. So the first thing I want to do is bring in some of that data that we got um, from our downloads, and I'm going to start with the elevation maps. So I'm inside. I found my USGS files folder, which has all the downloads that I did, and these are the elevation maps. I'm just going to drag these here. And there we go. We got our four maps. Uh, the first thing that strikes me is there are seams, right? Our seams in our data. Uh, before I go any further, I'd like to group these so that we can keep things organized. So I'm going to select them all, right click, group selected, and I'm just going to call this DEM for digital elevation maps. And it's going to put them all in there. So to zoom in and out, um, you can either change the scale here. Right, so zoom really far in. And there's a difference between zoom and scale. Like there's magnification and there's scale. Um, and the scale is important later when we actually export this data. Uh, you can also use the scroll wheel to change the scale. You can see how it changes the scale at the bottom. If you hold the control wheel while you scale, it's a finer movement. You can use the uh, middle mouse button and then I got that click down. Now I'm just panning and dragging my screen around. I can hit uh, shift control F to kind of zoom in to fill my screen. Um, and then if for some reason you, you move your thing way off to the side and you can't find it and you're just kind of lost in this white screen, you can always click on anyone, anything over here, right click and say zoom to layers and that'll bring everything back to you. So you see how that brought it right back to the center for us. All right. All right. So let's talk about these seams. Uh, we can get rid of these by using this raster miscellaneous build virtual raster option. So I told you how to get that set up. So I'm going to click on that. And a couple options here, we want to use the highest because we don't want to change our resolution. I found that in Blender, the resampling algorithm that works best, at least for me, has been bilinear. So I'm going to change that. And then over here, these little three dots, this is going to let us check which files we want to use. Right now, because we only have the elevation maps in here, I can just say select all. It's going to click them all. And I can click run. And it's done. So you can see over here, it created this virtual layer. And I'm going to click and drag that and just move it out of the elevation map. So we can hide those. We're kind of done with those. And you can see right away that those seams have gone away. It's blended all four of those maps together. And we have a nice seamless map. All right. The next thing to do is to bring in our Landsat data. So I'm going to click all three of them. I'm going to drag and just bring it onto my canvas and it's going to ask me some questions and I'm just going to say yes I want to add this group to all these layers to a group and it's going to ask me some other questions I'm just going to click through and say okay okay add layers okay okay all right so now we have our Landsat data All right, so we can see our Landsat data here. These Bs are bands, so band 1, band 10, 11, 2. And then if we open up one of these, you can see that there's a number in here on a gradient. This is the number of meters either below or above mean sea level on your map. So if that was useful information to you, that's what that means. We're only really interested now in the um, bands 2, 3, 4, and 8. So let me hide our virtual dem and I'm going to hide just make sure everything's set up here All right so I want to rename this so I'm going to rename I'm going to call it virtual dem and just hide that so we're going to look at our bands here now band 2 
so Landsat gathers data based on frequencies of light. So band two is uh, blue light, band three is green light, band four is red light, band five is near infrared light. Uh, these are all 30 by 30 meter resolution uh, scans. And then band eight is a panchromatic band, um, and that's a 15 by 15 meter scan. So it's got four times the amount of data in it as the other bands do. So we're going to use the two, three, and four, or the blue, green, red channels, to recreate the color of our map. And then we're going to use B8 uh, to add some uh, bump map detail later on. So the first thing I want to do is I want to take the twos, I want to you know, group my blues, my reds, and my greens together. And you can see that in here, this, this map doesn't look particularly blue or green or anything. And that's because these bands uh, only measure the intensity of a frequency of light. Uh, so you know, on the blue band, anything that's really bright would be a lot of blue frequency light. Anything that's dark would be an absence of blue. And then we need to combine these back together to create uh, a true color image. So I'm going to take the two from here and the two from here. And I'm just control clicking on these so I can select them as well. And then two from there. And I'm going to move them up to the top. So they're here, and I'm going to group these together. I'm going to call it group, and I'm going to call it B2 blue. And minimize that. And I'm going to do the same thing for the green band, which is three. And the red band, four. And the panchromatic, which is eight. Now these other bands do have some value. For example, band five is near infrared. Um, you can actually use this to artificially um, enhance areas that have plant life since uh, the band five data is good at picking up green leafy uh, vegetation. So if you needed to add some maybe extra green that was realistically placed on your scene, you could use the data from B5 uh, to do that. But for this tutorial, I'm pretty much done with these data sets. We're not going to use them. We're really just going to focus on these three layers. Now, if you were only doing a single tile, if your area of interest only covered one area, your life is a lot simpler because you don't have to worry about blending uh, these pieces together because you don't, you don't have to worry about you know, an obvious seam here with your colors. So, But since we're doing a composite, we're going to have to do a little bit more work. So let's start with the red band. And if I open this up, and the blue bands are off, so we're really just looking at the red channel. It doesn't look particularly red. And I want this one here to, to be on the bottom since it's kind of, this is the area of interest here, I think. If we look at our elevation map, I'm going to move that up. Uh, I want the dim, the virtual one. Let's move that up to the top so we can see it. So you can see that the intersection of these two sets of tiles is, is kind of in this area. So this is where we're going to be taking our composite data from. We can't take all of this data because the elevation map only goes so far and only overlays you know this middle section. So we're really only interested in this section. It may be just a little bit off of this one, but certainly these two. So I want that's why I want this this one here to kind of be on the back. All right, next thing to do is add some color to these. And we do that using layers. So starting with, say, this one, I can go over here to my layer styling, and I want to change to a single band pseudo color. And I can double click on my gradient, and it's already set to black here, so that's fine. But I want this end to be blue, and I want it to be a pure, blue, I'm sorry, I want this end to be pure red. So I can either drag this around, or better yet, if I want to be absolutely certain that my values are 100%. So FF000 is pure red. So now I have a gradient from black to pure red. I can say OK, and that's going to colorize this. If you like, you can right click and save your color ramp. And I've already done that for my blue, greens, and reds, so I don't have to keep doing this. You can see I've got a blue band, a green band, and a red band. And that's how I created them. I just created that black to red, black to pure green, black to pure, pure blue, and then I named them. So now if I go to another band and I change my thing to a single band, I can choose red band from my list and it'll take it and we'll do the same thing here. I'll just change that to single band and it 
but it'll use the last one by default. So we've got three reds. Now you can see that these don't match up right. right this one is much darker than these are. Um, we're going to fix that later. Uh, we're actually going to fix it in Photoshop. Uh, so let me do the same thing with the blue or the green and the blue. All right, so now we have each of the bands turned to its you know, appropriate color. The next thing to do would be to change the modes of, you know, the mixing modes. So if we go into select the green, for example, you can see down here there's normal. I'm going to change that to screen and change this one to screen and change this one to screen. All right, you can see that we start to get some coloring in here. Uh, the reason we need to fix this outside of uh, QGIS and not in so the reason I'm going to fix this in Photoshop and not QJS is I haven't figured out a way to prevent this kind of, I don't know what to call it, uh, but the different layers are bleeding through each other because they're overlaying. In Photoshop, I can avoid that. I can you know, work on each of these individual layers individually, and I'll show you what I mean later. But at least you're starting to see that the colors are starting to come through. Uh, and if we do something similar with the blues, we want to change these to also screen and start to get our real color here. All right, so now you can see, you know, in this one, by putting together the red, the greens, and the blues, we get that real color information out of the three black and white images. So that's kind of cool. All right, so the next thing to do is to define another area of interest here, which is the intersection of our uh, scene. So if I click on Virtual Dem, so this is, you know, where this is, and I want to pick an area of the map where all three, all three of these color uh, swatches, as well as the elevation map, all overlap. And you know, like I said, we might get just a little bit of that one there. So what I want to do here is I want to go up to the top, and I want to go to this V-shaping V-shaped icon and, and click on New Shape File Layer, and I'm going to call it Crop, and I'm going to call it Geometry is a Polygon, and I don't think I need to change anything else and it's going to complain when I click OK and I'm going to say yes and now I've created a crop layer and now if we go up here under tools and I click on this toggle editing pencil and I want to click on this drop down and add a rectangle from extent right this is one of the toolbars that I had you add at the beginning and I'm just going to click and drag I'm sorry I'm going to click and then I'm going to drag down to the right and I don't want to go outside this this line here I want to stay inside I want to try to make it as square as possible, and then I'm just going to right-click to lock my my square, and then I'm just going to give it a number. It doesn't matter what the number is; it just needs an ID number. So there is our. This, you think of this as like a cookie cutter that we're going to use to cut identical pieces out of the maps that we can then import into Blender. Now I don't need it to be opaque; I just need it to be there, just exist. All right, it doesn't matter what color it is or anything. So I'm just going to turn that off for now. And the other thing I want to do is I want to just look at our our eight panels. So those are our individual um, 15 meter uh, panchromatic scans. So we're going to export these as well. So how do we ex export these? I will actually want to export these um, not by color, but by bandwidth. So if I turn all these on, and I'm going to turn off the second, the second and third group. So I just have really just the combination of the first group. So we have our, our true color version of this swatch. All right. So if I go to our scale, and this is this is important for exporting because it's it's going to export your data with as much data as your scale sets. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, you know this is going to output a kind of a low, very low resolution of your image. And you know this is going to output a very high resolution of your image. The downside is this file is going to be massive. It's going to be quite a large file. So you may want to find something that your machine can take. You know, it really depends on how, how meaty your machine is, uh, how much uh, memory you have. Um, we'll try at uh, 1 in 100,000 scale, uh, see what happens. So set your scale first. And we have all three channels turned on. So we have a true color version for this particular swatch. I then want to go to Project, Import, Export, Export Map to Image. 
All right, so here the order that you check these things is kind of important because they tend to affect things downstream, so don't just kind of click randomly. Uh, start with layer, and you want to choose that crop icon that we had, so crop. And that's going to tell QGIS that it wants to only output uh, any portion of this map that lives with inside that square that we drew. All right, and that's how we're going to make sure that all of our images line up on top of each other. So this is a color image. 96 DPI is probably fine. Uh, you can see that it's already at over 4,000 pixels. Uh, we don't need any of these. You can click on those. And then we can just save it. So you want to click Save. And you can see that I've already saved these out here. I've already did this as a test. Um, so this one would be uh, the B2 version. Um, so yeah, so I'm just I'm not going to actually resave over these things, but uh, you can see that you would just save this, give it a name, save it as a ping, and save it out to your disk. And then you would do the same thing for the others. You would turn off the first one, turn on the second one. Don't move your screen. Right? For some reason, moving the screen makes a difference sometimes. Go back to project, import, export, and then do exactly the same thing. You want to choose the crop. You want to keep your scale the same. You want to change your keep your resolution the same. And then again, save it as a PNG file for this, you know, the second swatch. And then do the same thing for the third swatch. And then you want to do the same thing for the panchromatic bands. You want to just save these one at a time, right? Because they're all just the black and whites and you want to do exactly the same thing. So turn this one on, go to project, import, export, export map, choose crop, um, and then, you know, uncheck these. And for this one, um, because it's a grayscale map, you might want to try 300 BPI. Uh, and if you tab out of this, it's going to tell you how much, how big your, your new file is. So a 13,000 pixel file isn't too bad. If you had been zoomed in to higher resolution, this, this number gets crazy fast. You can get like 50,000 by 50,000 or 60,000 by 60,000, um, which is hard for a lot of machines to handle. So just be cognizant of uh, these grayscale ones, uh, both the uh, band eight and the uh, the d digital elevation map, you want to save at a high BPI or DPI, but it is going to increase your file size. So I would save this, and I would save all three of them, just one at a time. Do exactly the same thing, and then for the virtual dim, we're going to do basically the same thing. I'm going to have the virtual dim turned on, right? So that's our merged elevation map. And again, you would go to uh, import, export, export map to image, choose the crop tool to make sure you're exporting just the area you want to. And for this, you would definitely want to set this to 300 because you really need that. You really need that density to get a good, um, a good uh, grayscale image for your displacement in Blender. And then you, know, you would check these off and then you would save that. And you can see that I've saved uh, my R8 out here and I have my dem files also already saved off. All right, so that I think is it for most of the stuff inside of QGIS. The only thing I wanna show you that's a little different is um, how to fix holes in data. So I'm going to bring this whole example in and I'm gonna right click because this hole isn't from California, it's actually from Alaska or from Washington State, uh, Canada border. So this is a demo I was playing with earlier, and sometimes there's missing data. So if you look at this, zoom in, you can see these big white spots. This is for because for whatever reason, the satellite was unable to include data in the file, and this is just holes. And what's gonna happen is if you bring this file into Blender, these white spots are gonna be basically infinitely high. You're gonna get these massive spikes in your, ter in your terrain. Um, which is clearly not what's supposed to be happening there. I mean, they're just mountains um, or valleys, uh, but there's there's holes. So Blender's not going to know what to do with them. Just going to have these massive spikes. So to fix that, you want to go to the processing toolbox, and you want to look for that hole filling tool that I showed you at the beginning. I mean, I could actually look for no data. Probably better. So this fill no data tool. So I double click on that and bring it over here. Uh, not a lot of options here. This one uh, is just gonna, how, how many times is it gonna try to run through the algorithm to fill these holes? 
I know that on this particular one, I wasn't able to get it to work until I got to like 40, uh, but you can click run. And it's gonna to try to interpolate based on the surrounding area, uh, just to kind of guess what really should be there. So there it filled in those holes just fine. Um, but I know that further up on the map, there's still spots that are missing. And the nice thing is you can rerun it again. So you can click change parameters and I'm gonna click on, I'm gonna type 40 here and I'm gonna click run and we should see the, the holes disappear. All right, so maybe that wasn't a hole. But I know, I know that in previous tests, I needed to actually get to 40 to fill in some of the gaps. Uh, but now you can see, looking at this map, we don't have any of those those massive white spots. We've got you know, gray spots, but uh, not looking at any of those, those gaping holes. So anyways, if you come across data uh, that's missing, if you've got some holes in your data, you want to use this fill no data tool uh, to fix that. And you can see that each time I ran that, it created a virtual layer. Right, so I don't need any of these. These are junk. Get rid of them. All right, so here we are in the directory that has the bands that I saved. So you can see here's one of the color bands. There's another one. There's another one. These are the individual uh, band eight images. And then we have the elevation map as well. So let's open one of these in Photoshop. So open with Photoshop. And that's what comes in. So I'm going to actually drag the other ones on there. I'm just going to drag them over. You know, I'm going to move this one out of the way. And I'll bring my Photoshop up here. And then I'm just going to drag these in from my other screen and just uh, drop them on here. Right, so that's another color one. I'll just place that. And then before I'm going to place, place that. And yeah, the key here is to make sure that they're lined up on the background. Um, and they're just, they're just going to snap into position. It should be okay. Because they're all going to be exactly the same size because we used that crop like tool that we made to make sure that they all line up nicely on top of each other. So I'm just making sure that they're all snapped good. All right. So the next thing I want to do is I want to get rid of this white stuff. So if I hit W to get my magic wand, and I can click there, and then I can click here. And I can hit the delete key and it's going to delete all that. I don't need that. So I control D, deselect it, turn this one on. I need to change it to raster. And I'm going to select this one and delete it. And I'm going to do the same thing for this one. And I need to rasterize that. And I need to delete it. All right. And now, of course, I want to change the order here because this piece up here really is just, just a tiny corner here. And and you know, the bottom one seems to be the best one. So the next thing to do is to select these layers, control M, and then you can use the curves tool to try to blend these together. So if I just make this a little brighter, and you can of course go in and adjust the reds, the greens, and the blues. Um, that seemed to blend pretty well there. And then do the same thing for this bottom one, control M to bring up curves, and just bring that up till it blends nicely. You know, and that one might be a little bit too much green, so we can maybe pull the green down a little bit. Maybe not. Maybe the blues. It's better to pull colors out than add them in, otherwise they get oversaturated. All right, I'm not going to fret over it too much because it's just a corner. Um, so there's our full color image of our San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and just doing it in Photoshop uh, with the curves tool just was a lot easier than trying to fiddle it with in, in, in QGIS. I was not able to find any way in QGIS to actually do what I just did in Photoshop. So I'm going to group these three together. And that'll be my color palette. And now I'm going to bring in my band eight images. And we're going to do basically the same thing with these. I just want to make sure they're placed properly. So that one looks like it's okay. That one looks like it could go up. So it snaps up. That's good. And this one looks okay. Snap. And just double check that one. 
snap. Okay, and then just rasterize these. W magic wand, delete the selected, control D. All right, now if we turn them all back on, you can see we've got some blending issues. Oh, so I'll save it later. Um, so I want this one in the back, because that's the least important one. And we're just basically going to do the same thing, where I use control M to change the brightness. I don't want to change that one, I change the one at the top. So control M and just bring that up until it looks like they're seamless, right? So I'm pretty happy with that. And then the bottom one as well, control M and just raise that up. Right. And this, the, the band eight that I'm looking at right now, we're really just going to use for creating a bump map because it has, it has really nice detail that we can use to add extra details to our terrain. They're really fine. All right, so that is it for setting them up in Photoshop. The next thing, of course, to do would be then to save each of these. So I'm going to group these and call it band eight. And then you would just save, uh, this is a TIFF probably because you don't want to lose any of that data. So save as, and um, so as a TIFF, and you can see that I already have um, a DEM already saved out. You can actually probably save this one as a PNG. Um, yeah, I already saved, I already saved a version of, uh, of the band eight as a PNG, and I already have a version saved out of the color as a PNG. Uh, and then of course the, um, the DEM itself is already a TIFF, and that really needs to be a TIFF so we don't have any data loss. Uh, the next thing to do, and this, this next part's a little tedious, um, but I couldn't think of any way to do it in uh, the USGS sol uh, software, was to identify bands of water. So this is a file that I've already worked on, basically the same area, um, but I have the water mask already worked on here. So what I did is I just took a pen and I colored in a new layer of everywhere that I saw there was water. And I did it in red to make it easy for me to see. And then you know, once I was done coloring in the water, I hit Control J to duplicate my color. Um, but that should, I always had the black one selected. So I Control J to duplicate my water and then Control U, uh, saturation and lightness, change the water down to black. All right. Now you notice that, so this is the one I just showed you how to do, and this is the final one that I did um, playing around. You can see that some of these areas that I originally colored in as black are actually a lighter gray, and that's because these lakes um, are higher up in elevation than um, other parts of the map. So um, when we go into Blender and we start using this water mask, uh, we're gonna use it both for as a material mask and to smooth out the water. So I just had to adjust the height. So imagine that this black layer is going to be um, kind of the lowest area of your map. And you can figure that out. If you bring in your um, elevation map, let me go back to this one and I'm gonna bring in the elevation map and place it. And we know that the, for example, the water is, is down here and we can take a sample of what this color is. So if I go to my eyedropper tool or and you know select here you can see that it's 020202 it's not really zero right so this level of black on our water mask should be this in hex 020202 um, but we also have a lake up here um, and that's at a nine in the mask so just when you're making the water mask so like you know when i was going through here you know i painted everything red that i thought i liked and then i converted everything to just absolute black but then I went in and I adjusted the, basically adjusted the height of the lakes, the altitude of the lakes, uh, just kind of playing with how, how dark gray or light gray they were. And then that just pushed them up or down on the map. This hopefully will be more, um, more apparent when we go into Blender, which is the next step. All right, so you wanna save these files out. You wanna save your, your water mask out as a mask. So it would look like this. And then you would save this as, this could be saved as a, as a PNG as well if you wanted, that would work. So I, you can see here, I already have a water mask file created. So we have a water mask, our true color image, and then uh, we have, as a TIFF, we have our, um, our 
digital elevation map. And those are the files we're going to use to create our topology. All right, so I can minimize this. And next we can go into Blender. All right, here we are in Blender. Um, I'm going to create a plane. And I'm going to scale it up. Apply rotation and scale. Go into edit mode, F3, type subdivide. And I'm going to hit Shift R a couple times until I get about 16,000 faces. Now I'll hit U for unwrap. And we look here, we can see that our plane is projected all the way to the edge of the UV space. So I just want to hit S and I just want to scale it in just a little bit just to make sure that our UVs are inside that zero to one space, just in case there's any noise on the edge of our image. We don't want that noise. Uh, next thing I want to do is I want to add a modifier, a subdivision modifier, and we'll say four, because we're going to need a lot of polygons in order to make this terrain work. All right, I already have a shader created from a test that I did earlier. So I'm just going to kind of do a reverse engineer of this thing we're talking about it. So let me bring this over a wee bit, and we'll take a look from the top and bring this down. Try to get everything here so you can see it kind of. All right, so here is the shader, um, and we'll just kind of walk through it. Over here we have the color image that we created in Photoshop. All right, that's what this looks like here. All right, that's our true color image, and that is color space sRGB. We have the water mask, right? That's our black and white hand-drawn image that tells us where the water is and where the land is. We have the DEM, a digital elevation map. All right, I have a couple in here. They're, they're basically the same, so it doesn't matter if I choose DEM or DEM default. Um, but that's the grayscale image of our terrain. That is non-color, that's important. And then we have the band eight from Landsat. Right, and that is our grayscale. And we're gonna use this for bump mapping because it has such nice detail. So going back up to the top of our shader, um, you can see I've got a couple of outputs coming out of the color. One goes through um, a color ramp called land rough and one called water roughness. And these are used to create the roughness areas for the land and the water. So the land obviously needs to be a um, very matte finish, right? no, no real reflection. So it's going to be a very light color with you know, maybe some light grays on it. But generally a light color you know, is going to call it, create a very diffuse uh, shader. So here you can see the result of this land rough. If we can zoom in, you can just barely see uh, the outlines of the land. And all that happened was I took that color image, ran it through a color ramp, and then you know one end of the scale gave it a you know 0.57 value, so so lighter than mid gray, and on the other end a uh, pure white value. So that's just going to create a very light color for our ground roughness, and then similarly. Uh, created one for water, which is going to be these areas here. Um, but for this, I chose a 0 0.057 for the darker side and a 0.139 for the lighter side, just to give it some variation. And then those two are mixed together, right, in this mix node, using this water mask node. So here's our water mask, that hand-drawn mask that we created. So it's going to put this dark gray everywhere I have black or gray and it's going to put this light color for the uh, matte or di very diffuse ground anywhere there's white. So the output result of this looks like this over here. And if we scroll out, you can see we've got dark grays here and then light grays. So this is the roughness map, and then this gets run into the roughness on the PBR shader. And the color itself uh, just gets run directly into the PBR shader. All right, so moving down, we're going to reuse this water mask over here uh, with the uh, digital elevation map. So the dig digital elevation map um, has some noise in it where the water is. So I don't want the water to be bumpy at all. I want the water to be smooth. And the way I did that is I ran the digital elevation map, non-color, into a mix node, and then I used the water mask as a factor 
to add just a, a very, very almost near black color to the elevation mask. And then that's going to generate um, just kind of a uniform smooth area wherever there's water. So any of these black areas here that are defined by this mask no longer have any of that digital elevation noise. If I take a look at the, um, the dem again, you might be able to tell that there's some like gray, cloudy stuff. It's kind of hard to tell, but it's it, because it's such fine data. There actually is noise in here, and it makes the water bumpy. Uh, so we're trying to avoid that. So that's what this little bit here does. Uh, we just kind of make a uniform color, um, which means that when we go through the displacement node, anything that's this color is just going to be absolutely flat smooth. All right. So we we've, we've combined the elevation data, which is this raw bumpy stuff. Uh, with a solid color for where the water is, and then that goes into our displacement node, which is set to 0.5 in my case, but depending on how high or short you want your, your mountains to be, you can certainly adjust that. One thing to note while we're in here uh, talking about the displacement node is under options, you want to make sure that under settings, you have it set to displacement only. You have other choices here. You want displacement only. Uh, if you have displacement and bump or bump, it's not going to look right. This is going; these are going to create all kinds of noise on your thing, on your terrain. You don't want that, so just leave it as displacement only. Otherwise, you actually won't even see the displacement work if you don't if you don't pick some kind of displacement option. All right, uh, moving on down, we have the bump node, which is going to give us some extra detail, and I'll, I'll show how these things look in a second. I just want to talk about them. So the bump node, or the the bump, yeah, the bump node setup reuses the water mask. All right, it comes down here, and in this case, what I'm just trying to do is, again, smooth out the bump for the waters. Now, the difference between smoothing out the water here versus smoothing out the water for the elevations is this is actually, because it's running into a displacement node, it's going to actually flatten, physically flatten the um, the model, or the, you know, the, 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 uh, the 3D model. It's going to make sure that these are absolutely, you know, flat, um, not just smooth from a bump perspective, but topologically flat. So that's what this one does. And that's the difference between these two. This one's going to physically alter the shape of the model to be flat in these dark areas. This one here is just going to make sure that these areas don't have any bump map. Because if you look at our um, R8 data, it might be hard to see, but you can see, oh, it's not that hard to see. You can see there's lots of noise in here um, from water ripples and stuff like this. And then if this was used as a bump map, right, this R8 data, if this was used as a bump map, we would have not just bumps on our on our mountains, but we'd also have bumps on the water, which is you know, we don't want. So that's the difference between this darkening and this darkening. And then this these two just get mixed together so that the uh, the bump map has smooth areas where there's water and bumpy areas where there's not. All right. So that's the output of this set of nodes, and that gets run into the bump map. So how does this stuff look in 3D when we look at it? Uh, so we can turn on our displacement, and I can turn on our color. So by connecting that displacement node, it's going to actually start pushing topology around. All right, and there's our scene. Uh, just so you can see the effect of that bump map that we added as an extra detail. I'm just going to see. So you can kind of see it in here. Let that render out. You got these fine details on the fields. If I take this off of our shader, just to give you an idea of how much nice detail that adds, I'm just going to cut that connection, let it re render. You can see how washed out all these features are now. Uh, just the mountains are all kind of rounded off and smooth. There's no real detail in the fields. Um, but by using that band 8 data as a bump map, I think it just makes everything pop. It gives the fields definition. You get like actual definition of rocks on the mountains. Uh, so kind of cool. All right, so I think that's it for the tutorial. Um, I hope that was useful. I know I had trouble finding information on QGIS and how to get the data out and uh, make it something usable for Blender. Uh, if you have questions, leave them in the comments. Um, if you know more about QGIS than I do, which is easily done, uh, and you can think of an easier way to do what I did, please leave a comment so that everybody else can learn from my mistakes. All right, I hope that was helpful. Thank you for watching.